Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, this is our webinar for understanding the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. Um, I'm going to take care of some housekeeping before we get started. Uh, this is a reminder to everyone that we are recording this. Um, we're expecting this to last about 90 minutes. If you can't stay for the whole thing, we're recording it and we will have it up on our website early this afternoon so you can go back and watch it when you can. Um, if you have any questions, be sure to put them in the Q&A part of the bottom of your screen. Um, it makes it really easy to download the questions if you use that one. So we can put them together later on for a Q, uh, an FAQ for our website. So if you want to go ahead and use those for questions, that would be wonderful. Um, the Hospitality Association is really excited about two events coming up uh, this in May. Uh, the first one, the National State of the Industry for Restaurants and Entertainment is on May 11th. Uh, National Restaurant Association CEO Tom Benet will be joined by operators Brian Moreno and Jenny Rojanestein. And uh, Katie Doyle from our Government Affairs team will be on this roundtable discussion. Once again, that's May 11th. Um, for our lodging members, um, we have a national event on May 20th, the American Hotel and Lodging Association CEO Chip Rogers will be speaking about available funding, how AHLA is advocating on your behalf at the federal level and what the future holds. Um, we'll also have a segment with STR on state room supply, occupancy, occupancy rate, RevPAR and more. Um, you can register for either of these events on our website, wahosp oh, I'm sorry, hub.wahospitality.org. Um, we'll also have our Restaurant Revitalization Fund Toolkit updated this afternoon, and it's on the same website. I will repeat that again, hub.wahospitality.org. And now we will hand this off to Marianne Scholl. Good morning. My name is Marianne Scholl. I'm honored to be here representing the Hospitality Association this morning. I'd like to um, welcome you and congratulate you for joining us you are doing your homework on how to apply to the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. You can think of applying on Monday morning as taking a final exam. By studying, practicing, and preparing beforehand, you'll be ready to ace the application. I'd like to um, also say that this morning's presentation is presented by Washington Hospitality Association with the Seattle Restaurant Alliance. And it's wonderful to have so many people here. I'd like to briefly uh, um, introduce our information team this morning. We have Julie Eisenhower, CPA and shareholder at Clark Newber, Newber where she leads the firm's hospitality group. She is a Washington Hospitality Association board member. We have Desiree Albrecht, who is an economic development specialist in the Seattle District Office of the U.S. Small Business Administration. If she isn't already on the call, she'll be joining us after her 9 a.m. presentation. And I'm here. So. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, Desiree. We're very pleased to be partnering with the Washington Small Business Development Center, the WSBDC, on this webinar. We have Ron Nielsen, a certified business advisor, who is the regional manager of the Eastern Washington WSBDC with us. We also have John Morosco, who is a business counselor with the Wenatchee WSBDC with decades of experience in the hospitality sector. He's also teaching at the University of the Virgin Islands in hospitality. John will be leading our presentation. Julie, Desiree, and Ron will be answering questions and providing clarification. We're gonna start with Ron Nielsen, um, and then he'll turn it over to John. Thank you, Mary Ann, and, and welcome everybody. Uh, this morning, we're gonna be covering the application on the uh, restaurant realization program, giving you some information that should help you uh, through this process. As you know, the, uh, uh, this morning at six o'clock, the uh, process opened up for you to be able to go in and uh, input your, your information the application portal actually starts on Monday, nine o'clock our time. Uh, so bear that in mind. And this is a first come first serve application process. So it's important that you get this information uh, inputted right the first time uh, and get your uh, all important you know, place marker in line uh, through this application process. The information provided in this presentation is relevant as of this morning 
neither the presenters nor the Washington Small Business Development Center are the final authority on this material. The information is subject to change at any time with new legislation or additional rules from the U.S. Treasury or and or the, the U.S. Small Business Administration. We do update this presentation with the new rules and guidance as, as they become available. And with all of the SBA programs, we recommend that you consult with your CPA, attorney, or similar professional for tax and legal advice regarding how these programs may impact your specific business. The purpose of this presentation is to assist small business owners with the use of the programs established by the federal legislation. Please note that the SBA administrator may change or revise the RRF at any time. Please be ready to adapt as the final rules are put into place. And with that, our presenter this morning is John Marosco. John? Thank you, Ron. And uh, welcome to all the participants and a very special thanks to the team that's going to be answering your questions um, that come up during the presentation. So uh, Desiree, thank you, Marianne and Ron. I hope I didn't leave anybody out, but as we go through, as I do this, um, there are certain, there are some slides that are just very wordy that at this point, uh, it may not be, uh, uh, well, it, it may not uh, need the information to go to everybody at this point, but just know that the slide deck is going to be published uh, soon after we finish. So if you have questions or if you wanna go back and read something, you'll be able to do it. So. I'm not going to and uh, read every slide word for word, but you're going to have access to go back. So, you know, make a note of the uh, of the area so you can go back and check it afterwards. So, my doing this, I, the really fun part is: Are we ready? It's it's happening. The opening, the registration is today, so you can get registered, and then Monday it goes it goes live and it's so exciting. It's the funds that are so needed in our industry. So as you're, as you're doing this, there's certain things that you can do to be ready for Monday. And I'll go through the timing and a whole bunch of things in the presentation today to hopefully make sure that it's, it's clear. So funds, we're hearing funds are going to go quickly. So I really, uh, there is a um, sample application and we'll tell you how to find that. But please, uh, I can't stress enough, fill out that application, because the sample application, because if you do that, I believe that you're gonna find that when you go to go live and put the information into the portal, you're gonna find that you have everything that you need and accuracy is so important. If you have, if you lack information or you don't have everything just put together perfectly, your application could be rejected and you'd have to start again. So, and again, we'll get into that. So uh, everyone can begin to file the application beginning Monday, 5-3-21. And there's a quote that I love that uh, Marianne gave us today. It's uh, from, the, I believe the SBA, be ready day one, minute one. So that, that's your goal. As we go through this, you have the weekend to do it. And I, I have, no question in my mind that we're hospitality people. We can, we can just about jump through hoops and get anything done. Again, accuracy is paramount in order to avoid processing delays. This particular slide, we will make sure that you have this, but there is a whole uh, reference of uh, areas that you can go to. The most important on this particular one is uh, connecting to uh, the resource. The uh, at wha.fyi.rrf, and you can actually go into the tool and find the toolkit there. Amazing number of inf uh, information that you need is right in that toolkit there. So I'm going to jump into this now. Who is eligible to apply for RRF funding? Okay, eligible entities are businesses that are not permanently closed and include business where the public or patrons assemble for the primary purpose of being served food and drink. So who's eligible? We have restaurants, including franchises. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Food stands, food trucks, food carts. 
caterers, snack and non-alcoholic beverage bars, and an example is ice cream shops, uh, ice cream stores, coffee shops, saloons, taverns, bars, lounges. Uh, this long list here are breweries, microbreweries, tap rooms, tasting rooms, wineries, bakeries, snack and non-alcoholic beverage bars and distilleries. Notice the asterisk. There are so special tests that have to be done for some of these. The on-site sales to the public comprise at least 33% of the gross receipts. As the, you know, listening to our wonderful SBA reps, they're saying this is a restaurant revitalization program. So if it, they're allowing, and I think it's great that these entities, as long as you have 33% of your um, gross receipts are for food, they're making this eligible for you. Uh, who is eligible ins? And again, the same th thing, 33%. Got a clarification and in, you have to look at your Nexus code to make sure that uh, not all hotels and inns are eligible. It's it, you look at the nexus code that you are um, that you have for your establishment. Airport food service, tribally owned food service operations. So the corporate structure. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but it, it's it's in the slides. But S corps, C corps, LLCs, partnerships, so in sole props. Those are the I think the main, but this goes through the entire list. And that's, um, if you have questions, we can come back to, um, to that area. Okay, so the possible funding. Individual restaurants may receive up to $5 million per location. And an applicant restaurant uh, that has affiliated businesses may receive up to 10 million. So the money can be used for uh, in tandem with both the PPP rounds one and two, idle and employee retention uh, tax credit, which to me is wonderful that you can be receiving those and still be able to uh, get the funds from the RRF. Minimum award is $1,000. So there's, there's a cap. And so if you did your calculations, which we'll see later and you come up with $800 uh, as an award, you will not be eligible for the grant. So it's a minimum of $1,000. So the time frame, uh, this is important. Award, uh, awards must be, uh, the awardees must use all of the RR funds uh, by March 11th, 2023 on eligible, and this has to be on eligible expenses incurred beginning February 15th, 2020 and ending on March 11th, uh, 2023. If the business permanently closes, the covered period will end when the business permanently closes or on 3 11 23, whichever occurs sooner. Awardees, awardees are unable to, uh, that are unable to use the RR funds on eligible expenses by the end of the covered period must return the unused funds to the government. And uh, there will be post award guidance uh, to follow, I'm sure, with the, uh, with the SBA. Uh, use of the funds. If the applicant fully ex uh, extends their fund, ex expends, excuse me, their funds before 231 21, they will be asked to certify if the application portal that proceeds has, uh, have been used on eligible expenses. So you're going to need to keep, keep good records. You need to know what you spent the money on. It's very important. All applicants that do not fully expend the awarded funds before 2-31-21 will be required to complete an annual reporting submission until they fully expend the award funding or the period of the performance expires. So again, you're, it's, it's an informal, you need to be reporting. So keep very good records of what you spend the money on. SBA reserves the right to request supplemental documentation needed to validate the certification. And funds awarded must be used by 311-23. You notice we stress that a lot, okay? No later than 3, uh, 12 31, um, all applicants are required to report through that application portal how much their award um, 
has been used against the eligible uh, use category. So uh, again, we're just stressing it's, it's keeping your records are very important. So restrictions, a lot of people have, you know, can I do this? It, so um, state or local government operated food service uh, businesses, these are people that are, this are organizations or people that cannot receive funding. Um, owners or operators of more than 20 locations, regardless of the business name or different business industries as of March 13th, 2020. And businesses that currently have pending applications for receiving a grant under the sh uh, shuttered uh, venue operators grant the SVOG. Important is you can do one or the other uh, at this point, but if you have, if you have a pending application or at this point, it, it, um, you have received funds under the SVOG, you're not allowed to, uh, you're not gonna be eligible for these fundings. Okay. Other restrictions, publicly traded companies, all nonprofit organizations, and then funding requests over 5 million per location, not exceeding 10 million total for the applicant in any affiliated businesses. So that there, there's a limit. Okay, any questions so far? Are we doing all right in the chat? Yeah, good. We're Actually, doing good, John. Yeah. Desiree's doing a wonderful job of keeping up the, with the questions. Thank you, Desiree. We, it's always nice to have an SBA expert here. <laughs> so thank you, thank you. So this is very important. This is the attestation by the applicant. All applicants must certify that current economic uncertainty makes the funding request necessary to support ongoing or anticipated operations. This is one of the first things that you're gonna see. You have to certify and self-certify that, that, that you are taking the funds and uh, you're using the funds because of this uh, current, um, the current economic uncertainty. So I'm going to just lightly touch on this franchise bankruptcy and tax ID numbers. So just if any organization, you have to be listed if they're a franchise, they have to be listed on the SBA franchise directory. If they're not on that list, you can apply to get on it. And Marianne suggests looking at the National Restaurant Association fact, uh, their FAQ on this. Um, and it, that's also located in the toolkit. So um, it's just, the, it's important that you understand that the franchises that you're on the list. If not, there are ways to see if you can get on there. Okay, bankruptcy. So if somebody's declared bankruptcy, especially during this time, there is not a, uh, you, you have a way to, in some cases, to actually apply and get the funding. So it's possible to apply for the funding if you have bankruptcy, uh, if you have a bankruptcy, if operating under an approved, confirmed plan of, or, uh, plan of reorganization under chapter 11, chapter 12, or chapter three bankruptcy. You, can't, you cannot apply for the RRF if you have permanently closed filed a chapter seven liquidation uh, bankruptcy, or you have a, a filed either a chapter seven or a chapter 11, 12 or 13 bankruptcy, but have not, uh, you're not under the approved reorganization plan. So it has to be an approved plan to, uh, to participate that way. Very important. John, before you go into the next section here, we do have a, a question that we might want to have answered live. And I'm going to pose this to either you or Desiree. It says that our company has three EINs with one EIN owning the other two. Consolidated tax returns are filed under the one EIN. We obtained a PPP round one loan, uh, with including uh, which included that the three EINs. We obtained a PPP round two loan with two EINs and PPP round two loan with one EIN. How should we apply uh, given our PPP loan structure? This is a question that's gonna come up for many of you that may have been working through the uh, uh, payroll protection program. So let, let's, let's address that uh, at this point in time that will probably answer a question for several people that may be attending. Desiree or John, what's the answer to this? Um, I, I personally would like to uh, have Desiree work on this with us. I, 
from that complicated uh, with all these areas, I almost, I feel I need to see a little bit more and be able to decipher exactly where it's coming from because there's so many moving pieces in this particular example. Um, I don't know, Desiree, do you have a thought on this? Um, typically our guidance has been to have everyone submit the same way that they submitted their PPP because the, the PPP loan needs to, is going to be linked by the EANs and in, in things to the application. Um, so it's, it is kind of a difficult one. It may be something that we need to look a little bit closer at and get back with someone on or that I would recommend in a situation like that, that maybe they call the 844 number, the 800 number that I've posted in the chat, I can put in again, um, that is kind of our, our official knowledge bank go to get a question answered location, um, kind of the, the source, if you will. That would, it's, it's hard to say for that one. But yeah, I agree, Ron, you need a little bit more information. Is it right? If someone wanted to email communications at wahospitality.org, maybe Desiree can follow up with you. Um, but I do think the phone number is an important way to um, get clarification. If it's hard to get in today, um, reach out to us and we'll see what we can do. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's right. And Julie, that was really consistent with what we were discussing right before the, the meeting started. I think there's a, uh, a matching that happens between the EIN number you enter in the application and the EIN number used in the PPP loan application. So my understanding, and I would um, highly recommend that you confirm this through the hotline, is that those you should file an application with the same EIN number. So you may need to do more than one if you've got different EIN numbers with PPP loan applications. Yeah. Hey, Julie, Desiree, back to you, John. Thank you. A great, a great question. And that I think the, the, some of the, I, I don't want to call it tougher questions, but the, um, the information uh, surrounding the PPP seems to be one of the biggest um, areas that uh, we're seeing come up as questions just like this one. And uh, keep, please keep reaching out. And uh, Ron, thank you. So um, moving on with this, you must have, when we're talking about your business tax identification number, you have to, you must have a valid EIN, SSN or um, ITIN number and be very careful. So if you have an expired business tax identification numbers, um, you're going to be ineligible for funding. So this is very important. Make sure that everything is in order and that the numbers are there and what Julie had just been saying, please be very careful and look at how you applied for, you know, PPP or whatever, whatever your EIN number is, make sure it matches when you're doing your application, make sure that everything, the numbers are correct, the names are correct because every, I understand the, the process, what they're gonna be checking to make sure everything matches. All right, so when to apply. Okay, we're, we're right at that point right now. So this first slide is talking about priority in awarding grants the first three weeks, days one through 21. Now I'm gonna preface here, everybody can apply as of day one, and we are encouraging everybody to apply. However, if you're not in this priority group, you your application will be processed uh, on day 20, uh, 22, three weeks out in the order that it was received. That is my understanding. So days one through 21, I have two slides about this. It's uh, uh, dealing with women owned control and controlled businesses, veteran owned and controlled businesses and socially and economically disadvantaged small business concerns. And my understanding is that when, if, if somebody is socially and economically, they have to be both socially and economically disadvantaged to take advantage of that uh, priority period. John, so, I have a question about that that came in. Um, the question is if Asian Americans qualify as economically disadvantaged in individuals. I will look at this. Here is Asian Pacific Americans um, and that is under the socially, okay. Is that 
the, and, and subcontinent Asian Americans. Yes. Thank you. But they okay. would also need to, like you said earlier, John, they would also need to um, meet the definition of economically disadvantaged as well. Yep. So it's and. Yep, it's both of them. And so and for the for the record, let me just jump in here on a clarification point on that. Any, if you can go back a slide, um, John, sure. anyone yeah. who is, or maybe it was forward one, sorry, I have too many pop-ups in between here, but anyone who's yeah. in one of these um, presumed classes of socially disadvantaged individuals are already considered to be economically disadvantaged. So they don't need to prove that. So if you're yeah. one of the predetermined socially disadvantaged people, you're already considered economically disadvantaged and nothing else needs to happen. Now, the people that may be socially disadvantaged that have to prove economic disadvantage would be um, maybe a business owner who is disabled or someone who is in the LGBTQ community. You are considered socially disadvantaged, but you would need to prov prove economic disadvantage. And don't ask me how, because I don't really know for sure. So <laughs> sorry, that's the best I got. That's right. I want to ask for just further clarification. Mm -hmm. So here for under Asian American, it's specifically Asian Pacific American or subcontinent Asian American. So if you are a Korean American or a Japanese American, you are not automatically considered also economically disadvantaged. Is that correct? Um, I'd have to look. There is a CFR that I can check as we go along, but I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm guessing that that is encompassing all of them. Okay. We're, Korean, we'll get, Japanese, we'll Chinese. Information on that because them. I want to be very sure we have that for everyone. Yeah, I'll double check the the CFR as we're going along. So, what a team! Thank you all. <laughs> this is good. Okay, so just going back here a little bit, in, you know, a business concern that is at least fifty one percent owned and the uh, management and the daily business operated of the applicant are controlled by one or more individuals who are women owned, veteran owned and socially and economically, economically disadvantaged. And the applicant must self certify on the uh, application that they meet the uh, eligibility requirements, very important. And a lot of questions that come up, you know, I, I have one client, who is uh, who has uh, she has a women owned, woman owned business and is a veteran and so when it, her percentage with those two is about sixty some odd percent so they are eligible for that so you can use that combination okay so caution eligibility as a priority group applicant so just just know Ed, any anybody or any entity that try, uh, attempts or goes and re, re, does a reorganization for the purpose of qualification for the priority period, that will result in an automatic disqualification of the award. So um, I would say don't change, <laughs> don't change it if it's not there. Okay, so priority in awarding grants day 22 to the end of the program. The SBA will accept applications for, uh, from eligible applicants and distribute funds in the order in which the applications are approved by the SBA. All applicants should register on today, it's today, 4.30, and apply, please apply as, as early as you can, 5, 3, 21. And the, uh, just note the application will not be processed until the priority period has ended. And I always encourage, yes, I want everybody to please work this, you know, it's again, we're right here this weekend, get everything ready. But if you're missing a piece of uh, information, get that in, even if you go into the second day, but I encourage you see if you can have everything ready on the third. Okay, calculations, a lot of people have questions about this um, and the use of funds. Hey, John, so, so before we get, yes. Before we get into the calculation, we have another question here. Uh, and this is one that I think will affect a lot of people as well. Uh, this, this deals with the uh, registration process. And this, this person had uh, uh, some trouble. And Desiree, you may be able to answer this. I'm not sure if you have enough information yet on the, the process uh, from this morning. But here's the question. I received a confirmation email but was told I had an invalid login information. Uh, when I tried to log back in, uh, 
a few other business owners that I know had the same problem. Uh, do you know if the application site will be open before Monday? A prior webinar stated that the application information could be uploaded before the start of the program on Monday, which, which, which I'm sure is related to this registration process we're talking about right now. Any information about this? Desiree? Um, yeah, you know, I'm not 100% sure. I know that the registration site in terms of, so prior to today, there was a pilot period of 1,000 businesses across the U.S. that were invited to kind of be the guinea pigs. So the, the application portal had been kind of up in the background and they had been going through it, trying to work out any bugs or kinks through the application process. And so starting today, they're allowing people outside of that pilot program to create an account on the website where the application will go, but my I don't know how much information you're going to be able to kind of preload, if you will, into the application prior to Monday morning. Um, so my recommendation would be to, you know, go ahead and, and try and get that username set up. If there, I haven't seen any e emails yet about um, problems with, you know, the login information and, and things like that with the those kinds of things. I'm assuming we'll probably hear more if you have not already signed up for email notifications specifically related to RRF. So if you go to sba.gov slash restaurants, there's a one of the first links is sign up for email alerts about RRF. I would encourage you to sign up for those because any kind of updates like, hey, the portal's down or there's something wrong would be sent out to those people who had registered to be alerted by email for updates to RRF. Um, but as of right now, I haven't seen any traffic on the status of the site being up or down. I would say there's probably a lot of people trying to get in there right now. Um, so maybe give it a little bit of time and try back again later this afternoon. Um, and we'll see if maybe there might be some more official guidance as the day goes on. Yeah, thanks, Desiree. You know, this is an evolving situation throughout the day today. I'm sure we're, we're, we'll learn a lot more uh, as issues begin to pop up if they do. Uh, that, that will be researched and get more information out. Uh, there was one other uh, question that came up about the 14-day turnaround uh, process. And it's my understanding the 14-day turnaround process is actually a, a, a guideline. But uh, uh, do you want to provide any additional information, either Marianne or, or John or Desiree? Yeah, uh, 14 days is the goal. And um, we're gonna, we'll see how it rolls out. And again, Desiree, if you hear, you know, if you, if you have other information. Yeah, we have not been told even a glimpse of a guess of a processing time frame. <laughs> so we really have no idea any processing time frames that have been put out in the universe are our pure best guesstimates at this point. There's been no <laughs> promises made by SBA as yeah. to even the the guess of the pro the processing yeah. time. I think that it's, yeah is is it safe to say that was the goal, and we'll see where it ends up. We haven't even been told that that's a goal, John. Okay. We've been told nothing. So okay. that's why I'm saying that it's it's all kind of people off the cuffing it at this point. All right. Very good. Thank you. We have one more question to ask live. Um, our 2020 taxes are not yet filed. I understand submitting a PL in lieu of them can slow processing of my application. Is it better to apply right away with that PL or wait a few days and apply when taxes might be completed? I think again, I if I could, uh, Desiree, do you have a thought on that one? Oh, uh, how'd I guess you're gonna ask me that? Um, I'm sorry. You know, guess, <laughs> that's okay. You know, it's really so when we talk about a delay in processing of your application, I mean, first of all, if you are not in one of those priority groups, um, you know, for instance, you don't meet that one to 21 day processing time frame, so you're not um, socially and economically disadvantaged, take the extra two days and apply because your application won't even be reviewed until the, the 22nd day. So take that extra time. If you are in the priority processing group, um, you know, it's kind of up to you to determine, I would say whatever's going to make your application easiest for an SBA reviewer to process is going to probably be best because when we talk about delays in processing, you know, that's, that's a real thing. And if there's questions on the application, you know, they may, um, it may cause real heartache. And so it may be worth it as we've seen in some of these other programs. Sometimes people who uh, maybe waited a few days took a slight pause and, and let some of the 
other people go in and, and work out all the kinks first. And then later people, you know, they get caught up in the, the cogs, if you will. And later people who come in and apply, just kind of sail right through. And we know there is gonna be a limitation on funding, but um, anything you can do to make your application easier to be reviewed by the reviewer who knows nothing about you or your business, the better chances you have of, of getting your application through quicker and easier. Um, can I just add to that though, that we do have to, funds will be limited. So you don't want to think that you have lots of time to apply. So you're going to have to balance that and make your decision. Right. Because there, Absolutely. It's, it you, is a balancing act. We can't tell you exactly what to do. Yeah. That you have to make that decision on what you think is best because there is great need um, and funds are limited. Yeah. Okay. So getting the right information in. Thank you both very much. So um, we're at the calculation. A lot of people have questions about um, the calculation. Again, you can have access to this and there are uh, different areas and the toolkit has this information. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through the first part on each calculation one, two, and three is set up as, as it's put up with the SBA. And then I actually have some examples uh, for the you know, how you would do your calculations. So uh, the for calculation one, the applicant is in operation that you've been in business prior to January 1st, 2019, okay? So 2019 gross receipts minus your 2020 gross receipts minus your PPP loan amounts. That is the formula. And again, I'll, sh I'll do a calculation for you in a few minutes. Uh, calculation two is, a, is for applicants that began operation partially through 2019. Average 2000, and so the, uh, the calculation would be the average 2019 monthly gross receipts times 12 minus 2020 gross receipts minus PPP loan amounts. It sounds complicated, but when you see it in numbers, it, it's, really, it's really doable. And then calculation number three for is for applicants that began operations on or before January 1st, 2020 and March 10th, 2021, and applicants not yet opened as of March 11th, 2021, but have incurred uh, uh, eligible expenses. So the formula for that, it's, it's really a wonderful process there, in my opinion, that Somebody that opened up and we, you know, they were planning to open and it got delayed because of COVID, you have a uh, possible remedy here. So add up eligible expenses between February 15th, 2020 and March 11th, 2021. Subtract gross receipt, uh, your 2020 gross receipts and 2021 gross receipts through March 11th, 2021 and subtract PPP loan amounts. So those are the three calculations in the three areas. You were open before 2009, uh, you were opened before 2019, you opened in 2019, and then you have as an operation that had not, oh, it has expenses um, and they had not opened yet. So calculation one. John, one quick uh, question uh, from the, from the um, attendees here. This person is an inn who has over 33% of their revenue from on-site restaurant sales. Do they need to deduct the entire PPP funds received or only a percentage um, related to the restaurant operation? My, my understanding is the entire PPP. That's how I understand it too. Yeah, so very good. Great questions and thank you all for asking, you know, the, the audience, the, the group that's here listening, thank you. Great questions. So calculation one is, is as I said, pretty simple. And we have an example, we have examples here and some are made up numbers. And so if your gross receipts in 2019 were 500,000, in 2020, your gross receipts were 210,000 and all your PPP received was 50,000. So that's the information you need going in. The, again, the formula, 20, uh, 2019 gross receipts minus 2020 gross receipts and then minus all PPP loans. So the calculation in this particular example is uh, 500,000 
where the 2019, 210,000 gross receipts in 220 minus 50,000 of PPP received. So the potential and the grant may be with this calculation, 240,000 is what could be received by the operation. Again, pretty, pretty straightforward. The one that um, seems to have a lot of questions is uh, if a operation opened in 2019 or partway through 2019, and also where um, if you, you need to take into account partial months, which we don't have here, but we're saying full months here. So um, again, this, this example was actually um, I'm using from the SBA. They're, they're showing that in September, the operation opened. It shows the sales for September, October, November, and December. So that was a total of $1,500,000. They were open for four months. So the average monthly sales is 287,500. And then you multiply that times 12 because that creates, that's, that gives you a baseline for assumption if you were open the full year. That's what the potential revenue could be. So the formula is total annualized 2019 gross receipts of 3,450,000. Total uh, gross receipts for 2020 is 1,250,000. And then the total PPP was 700,000. Calculation, 300, uh, 3,450,000 minus your 1,250,000 minus your PPP. 700,000, so we're looking at the total grant amount potentially at $1,500,000, okay? And I need to uh, just, uh, the applicants that began operation partially in 2019 may choose to calculate, uh, use calculation two or three. However, calculation three could require longer processing times. And I need to double check that um, this, I, I haven't seen any latest updates. That's, that's the information that I had um, about three days ago. So, uh, but as far as the calculation goes, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And then we have sample calculation for um, the calculation number three, total, if you have a total eligible expense between February 15th, 2020, in March 11th, 2021 of 725,000. Total sales from February 2020 to March 11th, 2021 uh, is 350,000 and your total PPP was 125,000. The calculation is you, tar you look at the, your receipts minus your, the receipts of 725,000 minus your uh, total sales from 2020 and minus your PPP. So you may be eligible for up to $250,000. Again, these are just examples to give you an idea of what is in, in what to look for and uh, how the calculations could work for you. Hey, John. Yes. Um, we have a couple of questions coming in related to the PPP um, with this. All PPP funds are subtracted from the requested funding amount. What about grants awarded at both the local and state level? Either way, can we post a link with any guidance to back it up? Yeah, no, you don't. Um, my understanding, there is, I had a list um, earlier that was giving uh, that it, those state and federal grants, those do not affect you in that. You don't have to deduct those. Okay. Idle. Okay. Idle PPP and the local funding you don't have to um, deduct. And if uh, anybody has, you know, any of the panel, I'll uh, put in clarification in the um, chat. They um, should not be included. So local grants. There's a list of things that not should not be included in your gross receipts. And PPP comes out of a separate column. So, but if you had took in your local grant, for example, and it included in your gross receipts for the year, you need to back that out. Yeah, and, I, um, I actually, I think I have a slide coming up that addresses that too. I'm going to just put that in the chat because I don't know Thank how you. to do that. Hey John, just uh, some additional uh, thoughts on this. 
I, I'm in full agreement with what's, what's been discussed. If you look at the, uh, if you download the uh, application process on page four, it, it, it specifically identifies in, in question five and six that they're looking for, you know, PPP related funding specific to this grant that would have to be identified. It does not identify any other uh, grant sources. And remember the idle, uh, except for the idle advance, uh, or, or the target advance, the idle itself is a loan. So that, that's not going to be considered a grant, typically. But Desiree, could you maybe answer the question about the idle advance and the, and the targeted idle advance? Is that maybe considered a grant? Would, it, it's not asking for it to be identified here, though, however. Right. It's not asking to be. All we're saying is looking at your 2020 gross receipts. Generally speaking, that money should not have been included in your gross receipts as taxable income and should not be on your gross, your gross receipts, gross sales, whatever line that is on your tax return. Um, so we're just saying if for some reason, just double check and make sure that that money that you provided as, as your gross receipts did not include those other forms of finance of governmental support. To your business and the reason is basically because at the end of the day backing all the way out to what is the purpose of the rrf besides just get you some money it's to help make up for lost revenue due to the pandemic pandemic related revenue losses and so if your tax return revenue line is being artificially boosted because of federal grants or CARES Act funds and things that you had received because of the pandemic, then that's gonna lower your fund amount. And that's not the point. So we're just trying to make sure that you know that your gross receipts do not include any of those grants, CARES Act funds, things like that, that you had received, because we're really trying to get to your operation in 2019, what you did pre-pandemic, and then your actual what did you do business-wise in 2020? Subtract those out and then what? subtract out your PPP funding and then that's your award amount. Try and make up for those losses between 2019 and 2020 and then minus out any PPP that you had gotten that offsets any award amount. Does that make sense? Is that kind of more clear? Yeah, that was great, Desiree. Thank you for explaining that. And, I've uh, been doing a lot of these, Ron. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Uh, was there other questions? Yes, we have one on, um, we were actually talking about this earlier. On the PPP application, there's a section where you link your bank account that the funds are to be deposited into. Um, this person watched the SBA video showing this action, but it did not explain how those credentials are gained and transferred to the form. Can you please explain this process in detail? Right, I don't know for sure either. That was a surprise to all of us. Um, in terms of linking the bank account and how exactly that works and why, I, I don't know. I think it's to help ensure payment. Um, the only thing that we've been telling people as of this morning that's a good idea is to make sure that you're linking the same bank account that you're providing your bank statements for, okay? And so the reason why you're providing these three months of bank statements is so that we know it's an established account, it's not fraudulent, it's not a personal account, it's going to your business account. And then the link, the bank account that you're linking, I'm thinking that's because that's how they're gonna get you the money. Um, and so you wanna make sure that the bank account statements and the linking accounts are the same, okay? It's just one of those fraud flag filters and probably to eat to expedite the payment of the the grant but uh, as far as the mechanics behind it they haven't given us that information well, can i step can Please. i step back on that so what we're talking about is the bank account information that you're going to be asked for on the application and there's been a lot of talk about the three months of bank statements that you need which will be used for verification and um that's They've added it in from what we saw on this video, a different way to verify the account for which you're going to receive funds. And that is that you can select bank and then you can, it asks for your log credentials. And by credentials, what they mean is your username and password to get into your Chase account or your Wells Fargo account. So that is my understanding so you actually log in to your 
through this portal to that bank account, and then they will be able to have all of that information. Um, and from what they said, this is an immediate verification. So it will be quicker than if you do the bank statement upload, which will take longer. So if you have the ability to log into your bank account using your um, user ID that you use when you check your balance on your online account and the correct password for the account that will receive the money, please consider using that. Um, and also this should be an account. The account that receives funds from what I'm told should not be a recent account. It shouldn't be yeah. something that was created in the last five or six months. So that could cause it be a flag for fraud. So you wanna use an established account. You, so thank you, Desiree, does that make sense? Yeah, but I, I would not, I would venture to say, I haven't seen anything that says that linking the account is in place of the three month bank statements. It's, no, so they're, I would, they're both options, but in the SBA video, they said one would be faster than the other. So I would recommend. I think they mean versus manually typing in your routing number, your routing number in your checking account, like giving the manual routing number and checking account number. But that you, my understanding is that, sorry, at homework, really school, that. but that you still need to have the, the, the bank statements in addition to linking the bank account that I don't think that linking your bank account takes place of supplying the bank doc statements. One more question before we move to documentation, John, sorry. Um, there's a question regarding um, a bowling alley who has food and beverage on site that's meeting their eligibility for the 33%. When you're calculating the amount of the grant, do you include all revenue, the entire bowling um, alley revenue and not just the food and beverage? Yes. 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 <laughs> Any other questions before we go on? Great, again, great questions. And thank you to the team for the, um, the assistance. And it, it takes a village to make this all work. So thank you. So the documentation needed for calculations one and two, the, the, the required is application. These just, I, I just um, pulled these from the SBA just to update and make sure it was correct. I got that yesterday. The application SBA form three, uh, 3172, tax verification, IRS form 4506T, 2019 gross receipts tax returns, most recent three months of bank statements, 2020 gross receipts. Preferred on this is uh, the federal tax returns filed or the point of sale report. And we'll get, we'll talk a little bit about the point of sale coming up. And accepted may delay, this is wording from the SBA itself. So accepted may delay review past 14 days. Externally or internally prepared financial statements such as income statements or profit and loss signed, dated and certified to the accuracy by the applicant. So those are, that's, you know, again, it's, it's really very nice that it was what is required, what is preferred for the filing and what is accepted. Okay, calculation three, this is on, just so you know, this is on two different pages. So this is documentation for this required the application, uh, again, SBA form 3172, tax verification, IRS form 4506T, most recent three months of bank statements and the 20 and 21 gross receipts, at least one for each year. Preferred method of the uh, filing is your 2020 tax returns filed or 2020 filed, uh, fed, I'm sorry, 2020 federal tax returns prepared but not yet filed. 2020 point of sales report and 2021 point of sales report. And we'll, again, some of the, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the point of sale system, which is I think kind of neat. And then accepted externally or internally prepared financial statements such as income statements or profit and loss statements signed, dated and certified as to accuracy by the applicant. 
Then the second part for uh, the calculation is eligible expense, uh, uh, eligible expense documentation for expenses between 2-15-20 and 3-11-21, at least one this, uh, in the next set preferred, the qualified third party accountant, bookkeeper or certified uh, comfort and or certified uh, CPA certified comfort letter with associated profit and loss statements and, and uh, sheet documentation. Uh, and this provides faster SBA review accepted is and it may delay the review past 14 days externally or internally prepared financial statements such as income statements or profit and loss statements signed, dated and certified as to the accuracy by the applicant. So those are the, the, for, uh, the forms that they are looking for, for uh, getting the application done. And again, as you fill out your, I hope everybody goes and downloads and gets their sample application so you can really start working and have everything ready to go. And this hopefully today is helping to pull everything together that you need. This is just again, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm this sorry. is. Oh, go ahead, finish up. Yeah, Julie, go ahead, Julie. Oh, I just wanted to highlight that um, there's been a lot of questions about, you know, types of documentation, how much and such, and highlight the fact you've, you've mentioned this in your slides here for the 2020 gross receipts documentation that you're providing, they're only asking for one in the preferred. So I, in order to have that review process as quickly and as smooth as possible, I would not feel um, the need to provide them a ton of documentation. It's just gonna make it confusing and, and cumbersome that I would um, elect to do that preferred and they were only asking for one. There's no need to do both the POS report and the tax return. If you have the tax return, give them the tax return. That's Perfect. What I recommend. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent, excellent uh, suggestion and, and sharing that. Thank you. So again, a little bit of this is sometimes a, a little bit of a repeat, but it's important. So PPP, you're eligible for funding if, and we we already talked a little bit about this, but uh, you did not receive you did not apply for PPP already received a PPP loan, and have a pending application for PPP loan. Note upon applying for RRF. Applicants should withdraw any outstanding applications and uh, an applicant is verified using your e, uh, EIN, ITIN, or SSN number. Again, very important that these have to match what you did with your PPP. With the EIDL, you're eligible, uh, you're eligible for funding. You do not need to apply, uh, you do not need to apply the EIDL, EIDL Advance, targeted EIDL Advance, and the applicant has, uh, if the applicant has received an idle, uh, uh, idle advance or targeted idle advance, so you are eligible for that funding. Any funding already received through the PPP will be subtracted from the applicant's final funding amount. Applicants, uh, applicant is ver uh, verified using that EIN, ITIN, or SSN associated with the PPP loans. Again, you can see how many times we're stressing this, okay? If the applicant received, uh, received a PPP loan, the applicant must use the same EIN number for the RRF application uh, as it used for the PPP application. And just this last part of this, if an applicant applied for the first draw PPP loan for multiple uh, locations under one EIN number and subsequently applied for a second draw PPP loan under different EINs, the applicant must provide the EINs for each entity that received the second draw PPP loans. And uh, that question, I think we've, we've talked about a little bit already. Uh, upon applying the, uh, for RRF, the applicant must withdraw any outstanding PPP applications. So, and again, additional information regarding documentation. Uh, applicants that are a brew pub, tasting room, tap room, and the brewery, winery, distillery, or bakery, in addition to the documentation, the documents on the previous slides, document, documents evidencing that on-site sales 
to the public comprise at least 33% of gross receipts for 2019. These may include 2019 uh, Tax and Trade Bureau uh, forms, the TTB uh, filed, your and you also have state or local government forms filed, or internally uh, created reports from inventory management, sales reporting, or other uh, accounting software. Okay. And hey. yes. Oh, I was just going to say we have a couple of questions come in. Um, if you open on 9 25 2019, can you round to three months or do you need to calculate the five days in September? Um, I don't have an answer for that one. I know that you can use a, what I'm hearing is that you could create that into a fraction. Um, I, I, I think I'd have to uh, find an answer for that as far as you know, do you go to the nearest month? I know that if you're halfway through the month, let's say, I'm hearing you can use, let's say, 3.5 months. Uh, does anybody have any other information on that? I, I would say, go ahead. Oh, I would just say I'm looking for it right now, but if you have an answer, that'd be great. Well, I was gonna say, um, if you are, if it's 2019, and you're partially open, the, there is on the sample application a table that walks you through it. So it's, it's saying for like enter your 2019 gross receipts and then enter the number of months you're in operation in 2019. For example, if you were open two and a half months, you can round to the nearest tenth and put 2.5. Um, and then you divide line one, a, like that's first line by the second line to get your average monthly and then you multiply that by 12. So I would say in that instance, five days, I don't think is enough to really get that nitty gritty. Um, you're, you're probably safe at just rounding up to the month at that point and saying you were in operation for nine months. Bravo. Okay. That's, that's the way I was feeling that five days. Is, that's such a great question. <laughs> so. And in calculation two, what do you do with a partial month? That's the same question. That's the same question. So yeah. never mind. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Round it up at and use yeah. the table. Or as a partial month, you could go 2.5, 3.5. You could do a, a 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, what have you. But you know, whatever's going to make your math depends on how good you are at math and how much matters to you. But yeah, round to the closest half. OK, very good. So this one is applications that are for an in additional documentation uh, and from the previous slides documents. And then what you're looking for is you need to have evidence of on-site sales of food and beverage to the public comprising at least 33% of gross receipts for 2019. These may include internally re uh, created revenue reports or accounting reports. Uh, what can be expected if, uh, let's see, what can be excluded from your 2020 uh, gross receipts? Then this is the one we were talking about earlier. Um, this is the Paycheck Protection Program, PPP loan, first draw PPP loan or second, uh, second draw PPP loan received in 2020 or, and, and or 2021. Your SBA section 1112, uh, 11, 12 payments, and those are some of the uh, the forgiveness that was given during the pandemic. Your SBA economic injury disaster loan, idle uh, loan, and you have idle advance, targeted idle advance, or any other grant funds received via CARES Act. Any state or local business grants, and in this case, there's the Randolph. Um, Shepherd Act, which is the FRRP, and that's for uh, that's related to uh, blind um, business, someone that is a an individual that is blind having a business. So that there's we covered a lot of that already. So what can I use the funds for? And there's a, there's a lot, and I'll let you just read through this for time's sake. How are we doing? We're getting to the point we'd like to have some question and answer. So, but I'll go through these lightly. The, some of the details I'm going to skip over right now, but payroll costs. 
including things like sick and uh, sick leave or cost related cost related to continuation of group health care, life, disability. So there's a whole list here for you to look at. Payment of both principal and interest on any business mortgage obligation. And but you're not a, it's not a prepayment of principal in uh, principal is not allowed. Rent payments, including rent under a lease agreement. Again, prepayment of the rent is not allowed. Um, and since Desiree, if, since you're here, I, I was hearing if, if someone reserves some of the funds, if they get funding and reserves it, but not prepays it and just uses that over a period, let's say of eight, 10 months, is that that is accept, acceptable too, isn't it? Correct. So you're there, you know, the amount of time that you're spending these funds is, you know, you're covered period, if you will, for lack of a better term, is going to end when you run out of funds or when you close your business, if that happens. So um, as you're going along month to month to month, if you have funds available, you can make your monthly payments um, for all of your, your rent payments, your mortgage, your business debt that you have, um, principal interest, whatever. You just can't pay off your, your, your business mortgage. You can't pay off your credit, any of those kinds of things. You can't just go in and pay something off or pay for the next 12 months. You have Perfect. to pay it as you go month by month. Thank you. I think that's such a wonderful piece that uh, has been put in that people can do. So business debt service, both principal and interest. Uh, no, this does not um, include any prepayment. Again, you, you can't go ahead and prepay these. Business maintenance expenses, including maintenance of walls, floors, decks, surfaces, furniture, fixtures. So um, you have those. Then we have construction of outdoor seating. And no, general, uh, the general expansion or remodeling costs are ineligible. So be very careful with this. Um, uh, so if you're planning, if, if you're using it to, let's say, build outdoor seating, that is, that's acceptable because of the pandemic. But if you want to just expand general expansion of your business or remodeling, that's ineligible for the use of these funds. Okay, business supplies, including protective equipment and cleaning materials, business food and beverage expenses, including raw materials for uh, beer, uh, beer, wine and spirits. I, I do like that. If I'm getting hops, that should be okay. So. Covered supplier costs, which, uh, which is an expenditure made by an eligible entity to a supplier of goods for the supply of goods that are essential to the operation of the entity at, at the time at which the expenditure was made and is made pursuant to contract order or purchase order in effect uh, at any time before the receipt of the RR funds. So, and with respect to perishable goods, a um, contract order or purchase order in effect before or at any time during the covered period. All right, so business operating expenses defined as a business expense incurred through the normal business operation that are necessary and mandatory for a business. And it goes through rent supplies, so it, it gives you this whole list of what your what is um, what it can be used for. Business operating expenses do not include expenses that occur outside the company's day-to-day -day activities. And note, past due expenses are eligible if they were incurred beginning on January fifteenth, twenty twenty, and ending on three eleven, twenty twenty three. Okay. And John, can I just jump in there really quick on that sure. point? Because there's been a question that we've received a lot in past webinars that I'm sure we'll probably get again when we talk about those past due expenses. Um, a lot of times uh, restaurant owners have asked us, well, you know, I couldn't pay the utility bill one month. My business didn't have the funds. So I, as the owner, used my personal money to pay that expense. Can I get, you know, can we use grant funds to basically pay me back? <laughs> And so the question, the answer to that would be yes, as long as um, it was paid and incurred during that covered period on the screen, the 215, 2020, um, 
And as long as it's show, if you're basically paying a business debt on your personal expenses, it should show up on as a business debt to your, you know, you should have had a, some sort of talk to your CPA about that and have it on your, your profit and loss or your income statement or something to show that your business owes you money. Um, so as long as that's, that's there, then yeah, you can reimburse, your business can pay off your debt to yourself, that loan that you did to your business, if that makes sense. Wonderful. Thank you for that clarification. So I take it that from what you're saying, that question has come up in the other webinars. A lot. <laughs> so, yeah. a lot. Excellent. All right. So we have, how do, this is, we have, um, how to get assistance with the application process. You have a call center hotline with the SBA and the number is 844-279-8898. And uh, that was Monday through Friday. You also, we are really fortunate. The SBA is having the their dist, our district offices um, and you can actually go into sba.gov slash local assistance. And it will, um, I understand that our, our local, our, our, it's, I'm, I'm just going to say the SBA for the state of Washington has been phenomenal in putting out and getting all this information out to everybody. So I, would, I really want to thank them for that because it's, it's such a huge task that they're doing and the support has been super. So, and then you have telephonic application intake. That is, and what I'm hearing... Again, that's going to be longer so because uh, it could be that you're in an area that does not have uh, really or does not have internet service. You may have to do it on the telephone. It's going to take a little bit longer for that process because you're, you'll be talking to someone, doing applications and, and uh, filling out the paperwork and actually sending that back in from my understanding. And for and it's very important they have it's uh, there. This whole process is available in uh, multiple languages. So the access is there if somebody needs uh, any of that information in a different language, there, we have access to get that for you. What I have here is fast, fast facts, which I like. Uh, so corrections following submission and uh, pre-award funding will require applicant to revisit the application portal or call the support hotline to submit the correction. New documentation and uh, initiate at, at, and initiate a restart of the timeline uh, for review and payment. If an applicant intake, uh, excuse me, if an applicant initiates a uh, restart, it may uh, take upwards of 14 days for the uh, uh, from the time of resubmission for the SBA to finalize and review, uh, review that application. Um, the SBA will not allow corrections or uh, two awards that have been paid to the awardees. And for calculations, first day of business means the first day of actual sales. Um, three ways to apply for the RRF restaurant at sba.gov. The application is found at the website and be sure to, this is just my note, it's restaurants. Make sure you add that S in there. I had a couple of people saying the website doesn't work, but yeah, it's restaurants. Okay, telephonically you have 844-279-8898 and through a recognized restaurant, uh, SBA point of sales uh, restaurant partners, and I, these are Square, Toast, NCR Hospitality, and, and Clover. I do need to make a, a little a change here. My understanding is you can do the actual uh, application through uh, Square and Toast. NCR Hospitality and Clover, you're able to get information and they will assist going through the SBA portal. Um, did I get that right, Desiree? Yes, John, I was going to say one thing that um, I know there's been a lot of emphasis on the SBA application on the website, which is fantastic. But however, if you plan on applying through a full service point of sale vendor, which is Square and Toast, those are the two full service ones that will allow you to apply through their 
platforms or websites, Square and Toast, you do not need to create an account on the SBA website and you do not need to apply through the SBA. It's one or the other. So if you're going through Square Toast as your full service point of sale provider, don't mess with the SBA site, just stick with them. But if you're not gonna apply through those full service point of sale vendors, then either the SBA website or over the phone um, application. May I ask a clarification? If Mm -hmm. you're a restaurant and you had revenue that was not going through your point of sales, for example, through a third party delivery service, how do you deal with that in applying on one of those um, vendor sites? You'll have to check with Square and Toast if those are your vendors to see how they're handling that because um, they haven't given us any information so on that. If they haven't, and you had revenue that was significant in your gross receipts that's not captured, do you have a recommendation that they should then use the SBA site? Let's I'm say- saying, <laughs> yeah, I'm saying check with Square and Toast first. Check with them because they may have a way for you to upload that because you still have to supply the same supporting documents, whether you're applying through SBA or Square or Toast. And so I'm assuming that Square and Toast are going to have some sort of function built in for those instances where you have other revenues. I just don't know. I can't say that 100% for certain. So check with them. And then um, if that application process suits your needs use that, not SBA site. Um, if it doesn't suit your needs, you don't think it's gonna go uh, how you need it to, then go through SBA site. But it's one or the other, you don't do both, is the, the end of the story there. Thank you very much. And I appreciate, Desiree, I appreciate it. I had updated, I thought everything. And then when I just fl- flipped on the slide, I said, oops, <laughs> this slide wasn't updated with. So, and, and um, Again, yeah, if you can go through Square and Toast and everything's there, it's so nice to be able to process in a different uh, direction. Thank you all. Okay, so this is, we're getting towards the end here. Covered period, again, just I'm just recapping some of the things that are very important. Beginning uh, the program uh, is from a period of February 15th, 2020 and money, uh, money awarded to be used in full by March 11th, 2023. The program funding is $28.6 billion, $5 billion reserved for those with gross receipts of not more than $500,000 in 2019. What I love is that they have, the SBA has really done, a, 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 in my opinion, a great job in, in helping all different segments of our industry. So 400 billion has been reserved for those with gross receipts between $500,001 and $1,500,000 in 2019. And what to me is most exciting is you have $500 million reserved for applicants with not more than $50,000 in 2019. And you can, you know, if it, somebody that has a food cart or something, that, that's so important, They're, that's gonna help I believe, with uh, getting funds out to everybody that needs them. Okay, and this is just a very, this is a wordy um, document here, but it has the, again, the, um, how you can get to the portal for the Washington um, Hospitality Association, the FYI RRF, that's to that toolbox. And you have, I have the SBA RRF program uh, details. I have the website here so you can, uh, if you don't find it in the toolbox, but I gotta tell you, Marianne has, I think everything in the toolbox, anything you need is there. Um, there, And again, I'm just reemphasizing, they have the program guide, it was so well written. And print out, and I, 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 I just keep stressing, print out and complete that sample application this weekend, get a nice cup of coffee or a cup of tea and sit down and, and See if you can get everything answered because that's gonna make life so much easier for you. And be sure the information you submit is accurate. Errors can or may result in the delay in funding. Uh, You may need to resubmit uh, incorrect information. And uh, and I had already discussed this as a duplicate slide and don't hesitate to ask for help. The SBA has an excellent resource to address uh, questions and answers. And we also have 
the, an amazing team with the Washington Hospitality Association and others that uh, their team is ready to help in the SBDC, um, you can reach out to us. And if what I, you know, we, we all work together, um, the, um, the association, the Hospitality Association, SBDC, um, SBA, everybody's working together. And, you know, if, if I haven't had an answer, I have people like Desiree or some of the other um, members of the SBA, we can throw a question to them and they get back to us. So um, just use the resources and just know that we're all in it together. And I, I wish everybody the best of luck with this. And now we're to question and answers. John, no. excuse me, we have uh, 10 minutes and, and roughly 16 questions. I know there were several that were tagged here. Uh, several of these can be answered with, with maybe just a, a sentence or two. So if we can just do a kind of a quick response to some of these questions, and then uh, uh, those that have more of a detailed explanation, we'll, we'll certainly provide that if we can. Uh, for example, when one question comes in, do we need to include our EIN on every page of our supporting documentation? Panelists? I think it would be a good idea, just in case it gets uh, unattached somehow from the application, it would not hurt, make it as easy as possible for the review. As long as it doesn't isn't going to make your uh, document size too big to upload. So if if adding that to every single page and having to rescan it or something makes your document too big to upload, then I would say don't do it. And the maximum size I understand is thirty five megabytes. So per attachment, make yes. Sure that you separate out your files as needed to not exceed that. Yes. Great. Next question. We haven't filed our taxes as of yet. Like we've talked about this earlier, but just to be thorough. So we included our POS report for 2020. Should we include the POS report along with our taxes for 2019? Again, a POS report, guys, is not a profit and loss statement. That's part of the information for the profit and loss statement, but it's not a complete profit and loss. Okay, panelists, what's the answer to that? I think the application requires the tax return for 2019 support for revenue, and that's it. Okay, great. There was a question about QR codes uh, being part of the SVOG process. Uh, is, are QR codes being used in the RRF process? Not sure on that. Okay, not, not that I've seen either. I went through the entire application. I didn't see anything asking about QR codes, but I'm not sure either. But there will be some type of a um, a verification process while you're applying to prevent fraud. So you may be asked interesting questions about your childhood, where you lived. They could, so we don't know what they'll do, but be prepared for verification. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I was gonna say, yeah, I think that they're using DocuSign throughout the process. So anyone who's used DocuSign before knows that um, based on some of the information you asked, like Marianne said, you're gonna get asked some of those, did you live on this street or did you own this kind of a card? Things like that, that you may be required to answer. So um, definitely make sure that you're prepared to answer those. You don't fail the ver identity verification because I don't know what happens if you do. So that you have, if you are the owner and you're going to be the one that that account is connected to, then you really need to be present for the application process. That's not leaving it to someone else to do because there will be this verification need. And you will also have to sign the documents through documents. I always found it scary that they had all that information. <laughs> I mean, what street did you live on? It's like, really? You know this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ron. Do you want to continue? Sure. Next, great. Question. Next question. Uh, for Form 4506T, which is the tax return uh, form you would, would send in allowing the SBA to access your, your taxes from the IRS, do they want personal? 1040 or business taxes? They're verifying your business taxes that you're using in your application to determine the grant amount. So that would be your business tax return, your EIN number. What happened, and, and Julie, if, it, if someone's a sole prop and using their SSN number, so that would be their personal tax return, right? Yes, yes if you're a Schedule C, correct. Okay, the next one is we have three restaurants that each have their own bank account that sweeps into a uh, concentration account. 
will the portal allow us to upload three months of statements for all four of these accounts? Do we provide the concentration bank account information to fund the grant? That's a technical question, uh, panelists. I don't know the answer to that one. Yeah, we, we, we may need more information to be honest, Desiree. Yeah, I mean, my guess is we don't really have a ton of information on that. There's not a lot in the knowledge bank either. But um, my guess is if I had to take an educated guess not supported by any documentation or any guidance would be that you're going to be submitting the three months of bank statements for we're just you got to just pick one wherever you basically wherever you want the money to go um, that's attached to the business that's not a personal account um, that whatever bank account you link the statements match and that's where the money is going to go um, that would be my recommendation so some however you want to internally figure that out that's I think the bank statements and the linking is all to try and avoid fraud in the program and to that kind of stuff so I think you just kind of pick one and go with it Okay, Mary Ann, do you want to add anything else to that or are we good to go? Yeah, I don't have anything to add to that. Um, I, there are a few more questions on here. Are you going to um, mention those or should I? We have just a couple more minutes. Well, I'll keep rolling here. Uh, okay. If we can keep going, we're, we'll try and get through most of these. I'm a sole proprietor, but filed jointly with my spouse. To apply for this grant, is it enough to send in my profit loss, Schedule C, or do I need to send our entire tax return for 2019? Good question. Analyst? Entire tax return for 2019 is required. Yes. And that's for anybody. So I see there's another question down that says we have not filed a 2019 tax return. Will point of sale for that 2019 suffice? No, you have to have filed a 2019 tax return if you had to, if you had to file one, you were in business operating, you made money, you need to have filed those tax returns to be eligible. So, and period for 2019. And now, have, a, have they addressed the question? Um, if somebody has filed 2019 and uh, IRS is behind on processing several uh, tax returns, what, what happens to that, uh, to that person? They filed it, but it hasn't been processed yet by the IRS? They just need to supply the copy that they filed, the Perfect. copy of their 2019 tax return that they filed. Thank and you. They filed it, yeah. Speaking of taxes, how are GoFundMe donations that might have been raised? Those don't necessarily get included. Those wouldn't be included in gross receipts, correct? You don't have to put them, uh, they're a gift is my understanding. Yeah, I'd have to need to talk to the tax advisor, but it's how it's presented on the tax return. So if it's included in your gross receipts on the tax return, it would be considered gross receipts for the application process. Good, thank but you. That's a tax advisor question. Good, good answer, thank you. I did ask the PPP loan uh, structure question on the hotline, they could not answer it. So, uh, let, well, let me see here. Let's, let's jump down to the next one. If our business mortgage loan maturity date falls within the eligible usage uh, time period for our loan uh, calls for a balloon payment upon maturity. Can we use the RRF funds to pay uh, the balloon payment? Same question for line of credit, to pay off a line of credit at the end of its uh, period. I don't know enough about a balloon payment to make well, an educated statement. It's principal and, and interest combined, but, but it's, a, it's a bulk payment. It's kind of the question here. Uh, Is it paid at the end of the loan? Is that what you're saying? Because that's typical in the course of business. Yes. Yeah. Then yes, make that payment because that's what's typically going to happen. It's, we're just saying you can't do something out of the ordinary. Okay. Uh, we have a question about... I'm sorry, I just wanted to clarify, it should be a business loan I mean, in the name of the business. And then I would definitely keep documentation that that balloon payment is under the terms of the agreement because it is specifically spelled out that you are not allowed to do prepayments. So it, it might um, be implied that you're doing a prepayment, but if the terms of your agreement say you have a balloon payment, then I think you've got support there. Thank you, Julie. Our applications processed according to the timestamp 
uh, they are submitted or when they've been successfully processed. Meaning if the application includes documents that are slow, the slow the process versus tax returns, does that put you further back in line for accessing the funds? I will step in. I'm not 100% sure on that. I don't know that we've been given any guidance. My gut guess from working this pandemic and working other processing entity type um, jobs would be that once we, it would be stamped once we receive the full application um, would probably be. So if you're going through the application process and you, cause you can save and come back and save and come back. I, I think you have to get to that point where you've got all of your attachments you filled out the full application and you've hit that submit button on the portal and that would start your processing time. But if there are mistakes or there's problems or anything like that, like SBA comes back and said, hey, you didn't give us your 2019 tax return, then until you supply, you basically get taken out of place in line until you supply that tax return and then you get put back in, in, in line at the end. It's kind of restarts you is my understanding unofficially. Thank you, Desiree. Marianne, we're at time. We have five questions left. Do you want to go through the remaining five? Um, I would say let's do it. Anyone that needs to leave, um, if that's all right with you panelists, we'll just wrap it up. And then anyone that needs to leave can come back and we will be posting our, um, our Q&A and this session on our website tonight. So um, let's go for it. I also have a couple in chat that I might add in at the end. So we've got seven more questions and we'll be done. Okay. If I just started using Toast in April, can I still apply through Toast or should I use the SBA site to apply? Um, I think we kind of answered that with the point of sale. It, I would check with Toast and see what they, if they're able to, you know, wh what their application process is, how their documents are, if you can add outside um, documentation or expenses or things like that. And if it doesn't seem like they're going to support everything that you think needs to go with your application, then apply through SBA. You just have to make that choice. Thank you, Desiree. We have an accounting question. What are the eligible expenses for 2020 that I should subtract from the total sales since we opened in June of 2020, June 30th of 2020? Okay. Yeah. Lagged out in John's presentation here earlier, correct, John? You had a slide on eligible expenses. Yeah. So. And, and I don't think that they're subtracted from sales. Um, I think that your, but I'm trying to think. think in the that revenue is, yeah, if you had sales, I think you do subtract the sales from the eligible expenses. I think in your calculations. Right. Yeah, you need right. to get all the eligible expenses and then separate them from. There, yeah, was a, I'm sorry. there was a question. I'm sorry if I'm repeating this. There's a question on what are eligible expenses for calculating uh, um, table two calculation. I, two. I'm going to go back to that slide. Um, Just to, of those in the program guide. Yeah, business including equipment. Then that's an interesting question. It, it's it's they're saying eligible expenses it, it, if it's in connection with the operation and it's necessary to the operation. Let's say you know you're you're buying lettuce or whatever. That should be you know that's um, or supplies if you're if you're getting other kind of. Uh, expenses like that. Yeah, John, I'm going to say for this question, because it is a little detailed. If you go to the sample application on the website and you download that and you look at the table for calculation for, for number three, which is where your eligible uses of funds comes in, it, it'll say, or your eligible expenses, they say it's the same as eligible uses of funds. And on page like 13, it defines in a really long, small paragraph of text what your eligible uses of funds are. And so that should Thank spell you. it out for you right there. I would recommend Perfect. going to that sample application. Thank you. I'm gonna add that to my, my, our, uh, my list. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hey, the next question is, if a person, how does a person prove they're from a disenfranchised group? I mean, couldn't anyone claim that? That's a great question, Ron. 
Um, and I'm happy, I was gonna definitely bring this one up to the group to make sure that we could vocalize that in advance um, because I do think that that question is out there for a lot of people. So on the application, you are self-certifying that you meet criteria for the priority group. Um, there may not be um, much verification, if any, I'm not sure, they haven't shared that with us. However, um, anytime you look at this stuff on the knowledge bank, it's in big, dark, bold letters that this information will be required by law to be disclosed to the public. Um, so if you are self-certifying that you meet the requirement of socially and economically disadvantaged, it's gonna get broadcast out to the world. So if you do not meet that criteria, I guarantee you there's gonna be people out there just ready to chomp on this and to look it up and, and all that stuff. So you need to ensure that you are self-certifying properly because if it does come to light that that is not correct during the application process, your application will be denied on the spot. If it comes after the fact, well, we're just not gonna go there because I'm pretty sure the Office of Inspector General and all those other people will have a process in place to, to take care of that after the fact like they have with PBB and idle fraud. So we're just not gonna do anything fraudulent, right? Right, thanks Desiree. Yep. Next question. Uh, is the owner, the owner the only person that can sign the documents? I think it's owner and owner or authorized representative, but I think it, it, it needs to be someone who's authorized by the business to sign. Um, but like we said, with those DocuSign stuff, you're going to have some pretty personal information available. So you should probably have that owner on speed dial if you're the authorized representative. Okay. Uh, next question is, uh, just to clarify, I need to send both our tax returns for 2019. I'm assuming they're, they're thinking they're 1040 and they're maybe their business schedule, which whichever schedule they use. Yes, you need to you need to send your full set of tax returns. So we don't want to see the first page or a summary of or anything. We need to see that full 2019 tax return. Thank you, Desiree. We have multiple owners. So when it comes to the... Uh, DocuSign verification process, whose account or identity should we use? That's a good question. I don't know if it's going to separate it out by who's filling out the application and, and all of that. I'm not really sure how that's going to work, to be honest. Okay, the final question I have in, in the uh, Q&A, uh, do I need to include all schedules or is the 1120 sufficient? Again, I think you just answered that full tax return. Correct? I believe so. But let me see if I can get that answer really quickly. And, and by the way, it could be Form 1120 for, for some folks, could be Schedule C, it could be Form uh, uh, 1065. I and mean, there's a number of the business schedule forms that we're talking about here, really. Go ahead, Desiree. Right. So, yeah, please provide the entire tax return. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just have some quick ones from the chat. Um, this is again back to checking accounts. Do you want the business checking or the PPP? Um, account does it matter whatever's in the you can choose so I know some people have set up PPP funds where maybe they're using PPP and idle and whatever to keep it separate from their business operating funds um, it, it doesn't matter as long as that account is where you want the money to go and it's a banking business banking account tied to the business not to a person like a personal account and that is established no, yes I'm Okay. And then this may be getting too specific for the last question. Can you clarify that I need income statements and balance sheets for 2011-20 through 315-21 period, as well as 2019 and 2020 fiscal years? Okay. So I think with Robert, we've kind of gone back and forth. It's going to depend. So if you were in operation 20, like for all of 2019, or if you're able to use your 2019 tax return, then you don't need to include anything else, just that 2019 tax return. Um, but then looking at that other, if you're, so if you are applying because maybe you opened partway through or you're in the process of opening and you are going to be calculating using those eligible expenses, and, and things like that, then that is maybe where those um, income statements or balance sheets would come in and it would 
just be according to that time frame. So it's kind of a hard question to ask because it really just depends on the, the business situation. Or if you're using a, you're a business, for instance, one thing that I didn't, I don't recall John hearing that um, may be helpful for some people in those calculations when you're looking at methods one, two, and three, if you're an established business and you've been around for a long time and you're using calculation number one, but you opened another location under the same EIN somewhere in 2019 or 2020, you can use more than one calculation method in order to figure out your fund amount. So you would use calculation number one for your established location that you've had in operation prior to 2019. And then for your new location under the same EIN, you could use calculation number two or number three, depending on how it fits your situation, come up with that potential fund amount and then add the two calculations together to come up with your total fund amount. So then whatever calculation method you're using is what you need to make sure you have a supporting document to, su to substantiate those calculations. So I hope that's clear-ish. Thank you. Well, we're going to wrap up and thank everyone who was on the call listening today and also to our presenters, a lot of information. We will be able to take the Q&A and put that on our website along with the slide deck and the recording of today's presentation. Um, really important resources, sba.gov slash restaurants has the program guide, which will answer a lot of these questions. It has the links to where you can go to um, get your account today if you haven't done it yet. Um, also, please use our toolkit. We have links to all of these um, resources as well. You can go to um, it's hub.wahospitality.org. Is that correct, Lisa? Or we use a URL that's shortened, capital W-H-A, all in caps, dot lowercase FYI slash RRF. So WHA dot FYI slash RRF. And um, that will get you right to that toolkit. Do refresh your browser if you've been on it recently because you may need to make sure you're getting the latest information. So thank you everyone. We really appreciate it. Good luck, study hard, and um, we'll be providing other follow-up webinars and information on how to use the funds once we get to that point. Thank you.